Devil Anch was a patriarch of the Hatfield clan during the Hatfield-McCoy feud in the West Virginia-Kentucky border between 1863 and 1891. He led the Hatfields of West Virginia while old Randolph McCoy led the McCoys of Kentucky. Well, hello everyone, or should I say Merry Christmas? How y'all doing today? I hope you're having a hope you're having a real good day. I hope you're ready for Christmas because it's ready. It's here whether you're ready or not. Uh, <laughs> I am out today. I had to bring baby out on this one. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. All right. Enough shameless self-promotion. <laughs> <laughs> Today, uh, I am in a little tiny place called Lick Creek Holler. I am way up in the head of it. Uh, the, the last house is just ballparking, I'm going to say, oh, a thousand yards or so down this trail right here. Lick Creek Holler. And uh, for those of you curious, I'll... Uh, do a little video going back down at the end of this if y'all want to check out Lit Creek. Kind of a cool little place, little country, little holler, West Virginia holler, southern West Virginia. But uh, we have an interesting story to uh, for you today. And I'm not far from my house, as a matter of fact. And I came here to tell you guys a Christmas story. <laughs> Now, this is not your typical heartwarming Christmas story, okay? <laughs> you you know us a little bit better than that, I do believe. Uh, this is a Hatfield Christmas story, a hillbilly Christmas story. <laughs> All right, you ready? Here we go. Coleman Hatfield was the son of Cap Hatfield, and Cap was the second wild son of the Hatfield clan leader, William Anderson. But you probably know him better as Devil Ants Hatfield. Coleman, who was also a City of Logan attorney, uh, once wrote about a Christmas party that went horribly wrong in his book, Tale of the Devil. The festive frolic, as it was called, crumbled rapidly <laughs> y'all y'all kind of get where i'm going here right i mean you know hillbilly stuff right <laughs> i got uh, just so y'all know i'm on the hatfield mccoy trail system this is uh trail goes up right there 26 loops right here and uh when i'm doing tours lit creek collar is sort of an emergency exit in my mind I, that's how I use it anyway during tours. But uh, like I said, uh, Coleman, who was also a uh, an attorney in the city of Logan, once wrote about this Christmas story. He said, uh, the festic frolic crumbled rapidly. Young men who were congregated at the Maynards were mostly sons of local Confederate and Union veterans. Before long, scraps and fist fights erupted as old sympathies lingered from Civil War days that divided the young men, which came to a head on Christmas Eve in 1879. So warm up your cocoa, kick off your shoes, and be ready to be entertained in classic Hatfield fashion. <laughs> what I like is this story is wrote by someone who actually lived and breathed the life so we'll get a glimpse into what Christmas looked like in Appalachia in 1879 as well. Now, Coleman wrote the following in his book, Lick Creek, West Virginia. It was a blue, cold, and still snowing Christmas Eve in 1879 in Mingo County with an unusually strong and biting wind. The strong scent of burning oak hung low, meandering through the hollows as families from across the region huddled around fireplaces to stay warm inside their drafty cabins. 
young men and women of courting age from all across the hill country of southern West Virginia and eastern Kentucky had planned for weeks to attend a frolic on this special evening. It was a dance of sorts to be held at the Maynard farm. Young Mont Maynard, uh, a single fellow, uh, and his kinfolk lived in, lived in a multi-room cabin down the road here on Lick Creek. The day before, in preparation, the men folk chopped down a smaller pine from the hillside nearby here and erected it in the corner of the front living space of the, of the log cabin. The family pitched in on decorating and hanging homemade ornaments of brightly color stained paper. That's what they call it, color stained paper, not colored paper, color stained paper. Cool. Along with tiny bouquets of edible treats, dried fruit and hickory nuts wrapped in cheesecloth and tied with strips of fabric, red ribbon bows from the general store and small candies fashioned from tallow during the fall slaughter were carefully positioned on various branches. At last, the top was adorned with great grandma's hand crocheted angel, yellowed and worn with age. The clan agreed that the gangly, lopsided <laughs> old pine tree had been transformed into a sight to behold. On Christmas Eve, Mont shoved a crooked a crooked path in the snow in preparation for guests. Inside, he strung greenery and mistletoe around the room. The rough-hewn furniture had been shoved into the corners to make ample space, and handfuls of sawdust were scattered on the wooden plank floor. Jugs of moonshine were set up on the oak side table in the kitchen area, separated from the main living area by a long dog run or path separating the kitchen from the main living space. From the fireplace they lit candles strategically set in place. There was a soft glow creating long shadows in the main gathering room. The enticing aromas of warm spiced apple cider and dried fruit pies also filled the air, along with an assortment of other goodies the women had been preparing for days. <laughs> you can see where this is going, right? <laughs> Early in the evening, several local musicians had already arrived and were already playing guitars, banjos, and fiddles as locals started arriving. To an outsider, the scene would have resembled a Norman Rockwell painting except for the fact that trouble was already brewing among the guests. Big trouble. To make matters worse, John C. and Cap, the two elder sons of Devil Ants and Vicey Hatfield, were among, the in were among the attendees. In typical fashion, they soon got into the midst of one of the brawls. According to legend, John C., like many of the others, had been drinking heavily long before he even arrived. At some point during the evening, Jauncey butted shoulders with Dow Dempsey, a union sympathizer with a bad reputation in the area. A scuffle ensued. For some unknown reason, Brother Cap always saw himself as the older brother's guardian. So when he saw the episode unfold, Cap lunged into the fight. He instinctively threw several hard blows and knocked others from those who had jumped into the fray. The mountain musicians played on as if they were oblivious to the chaos in the room. <laughs> Before long, the Maynard family frolic had turned into a full-blown violent brawl. <laughs> a fist fight to behold, and the holiday decor and furniture was flying, soon scattered, broken, and in ruins. The Norman Rockwell scene was demolished. <laughs> Coleman 
wrote more about the incident and said that after being struck many times by Johnson and Cap, Dempsey ran for the rear door to exit the cabin. As he did, Harry Basden, a friend, tossed, tossed a loaded cap and ball six-shooter. Outside, Dempsey's boots crunched as he trudged through the granular snow. He snuck around the cabin until he reached a far corner where he peeped through a small smudged window. He could see in the blurred image both Hatfields still struggling with four or five locals. Dow Dempsey took him a big deep breath and tried to hold himself still. He aimed the old pistol, cocked the hammer, and fired several times in rapid succession, thinking he was shooting directly at Johnsy. Glass shattered, and there were several explosive flashes. The room immediately filled with billows of white smoke. <laughs> All music had ceased, and everyone had scattered or dived for cover. <laughs> Once the gun smoke had cleared, Cap was laying on the floor in the pool of his own blood. He had been shot in the kidney and lower colon area and was bleeding profusely. Clenching his teeth in pain while clutching his stomach, he somehow managed to pull himself from the floor and leaned against the wall of the house. Grimacing with each unsteady step, he inched his way out the door. Outside, he clung to the porch rail as he steadied himself again and crumpled and gulped large breaths of ice-cold air. Meanwhile, after the gunplay, Johnsy had exited the back door, uh, untied his horse, and settled into his saddle. Knowing that Cap was in serious trouble, he reined his mount around while grabbing the bridle of Cap's horse. As he came around to the front porch, he dismounted and pushed Cap into the saddle of his old mare. Within minutes, the two charged from the dangerous scene, with Cap flopping to and fro as he tried to hold on to the horn of the saddle. They headed toward Cap's Tug Valley one-room log home. By the time the two arrived, Cap, still bleeding, was leaned over and nearly falling off of his horse. Johnsy yelled for help, and Nan, Cap's wife, ran out the door. The two carried Cap into the house. Once Cap was inside, Johnsy climbed back onto his horse and galloped down the road to summon Dr. George Lawson, the county doctor. Later that night, Doc Lawson dug the ball from the front part of Cap's abdomen while cutting away a sizable portion of his colon. The surgery took four hours, and Lawson was drenched with his own sweat and Hatfield's blood by the time all was completed and stitched up. By Christmas morning, while others in the region were celebrating the holiday, De Valance's family gathered inside Nan and Cap's home. Fearful Cap wouldn't survive the gunshot. For hours on end, they stood as he lapsed in and out of consciousness. But astoundingly, by late afternoon, he started to come around. By nightfall, Cap roused partially from a laying position and tempted, attempted to eat a little. It was then that the family was relieved and rejoiced when Lawson pulled Ants aside and he said that he thought with any luck, Cap would overcome the shooting. Doc was right. Over the following weeks, with Nan's help and regular doctor visits, Cap did pull through, although he had trouble digesting food for many years afterward. Actually, at first, food such as corn kernels, beans, or other small portions would exit out of the gaping wound, making it hard for him to benefit nutritionally from anything he ate. He lost a great deal of weight at first, However, in the time, the wound began to heal. His body weight finally picked up steam afterwards. According to Coleman's account, his father reminisced about the episode in later years. Cap believed he survived the shooting 
due to his raw tenacity and his will to live, and because of the good Lord and the special blessing on his life. Although history proves that Cap and Jauncey would go on to face other harrowing adventures together over the coming decades, including dangerous incidents that would f include further gunplay and many drunken brawls. Cap, for one, never forgot the Christmas Eve miracle that delivered him from the very jaws of death. Wow. <laughs> now that is a Christmas story. Hillbilly style, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas, everybody. I hope y'all have a really good one. <laughs> Heather and I, we just really wanted to come out here today <laughs> and come up here. I drove all the way up here just to tell you guys a Christmas story. Imagine that. <laughs> a hillbilly Christmas story. A little tiny from the head from the head head of a itty bitty hollow this is leo with the hillbilly files hillbilly's out and for those of you who want to check out lit creek holler stick around and i'll video some as i head back down the holler here in a second y'all have a really good day and from heather and i to all of you guys Merry Christmas. Now this is the main head. And right back, right back there is where I was at just a minute ago. Oh, the other way. <laughs> Redneck workshop. This is the first house right here. Well, last house of the holler. The first one coming back down. uncle when I was little he had a, a camper up here somewhere way back up in here I don't even remember now where it was at but I can remember coming up here to his camper when I was about eight years old for those of you who have asked what is a holler I'm going to show you. Uh, a holler is just, usually it's a, say a creek runs up between two long mountains and you'll have wide spots here and there. And wherever you have wide spots, people will build houses and businesses and things like that. And they could be really, really long, long, just hollers, <laughs> just little roads like this one that go way back up in there in between mountains and the main road is on down just a little ways
everybody that lived here got, they got like 2,500 bucks. You know, your kids are infertile, but here's 2,500 bucks. Wow. Uh, 